as I've mentioned in previous episodes, they're getting a lot of artificial stimulation, artificial light stimulation of the eye in the middle of the night. All of this is through the visual system. So migraines, fatigue, challenges with your eyesight getting worse as you age, or even in young people, there's a, you know, at least according to the articles, they describe it as this epidemic of myopia. Huberman's warning about the myopia epidemic is a wake-up call for all of us. It reminds us that our eyesight is precious and that we have to take proactive steps to protect it. Fortunately, there is hope. Let's take some proactive steps to keep our eyes healthy and enjoy all the beautiful sights life has to offer. After all, there's way more than meets the eye. (laughs) And it was around laziness and, and motivation. And for somebody who's struggling with laziness and motivation, what is it that they're missing out when it comes to how fear fits into those two as drivers for good or for for worse yeah it's an interesting question you know we don't often think about motivation and fear as in the same breath or the same sentence um we are accustomed to thinking about the fact that when we're afraid of something you know we can freeze up Uh, but really motivation and fear are in the same pathway and Believe it or not, they're in the same chemical pathway. So the only way to talk about motivation is to talk about the molecule dopamine. Dopamine is known for its feel-good properties. We think, oh, you know, a dopamine hit, or, you know, it feels so good, a rush of dopamine. But dopamine's main role in the brain and body is craving, motivation, and pursuit. Okay. And in the absence of dopamine, we don't feel motivated. I'll describe in a moment a classic experiment that illustrates this beautifully. But dopamine's main role is to make us feel motivated and to crave things. Okay. And the interesting thing is that dopamine is the chemical. It's the molecule from which another molecule is made called epinephrine. And epinephrine has another name, which is adrenaline. So to untangle all that, basically craving and desire is the foundation of stress and fear. And people think, well, that, how could that possibly be? Well, stress and fear comes from adrenaline. So the way to, to think about this in a, in a kind of real world context is that when we are afraid of something, we have one of three responses. We can either remain still, we can retreat, or we can move forward. All three of those require some increase in our level of activation. And the molecule adrenaline, also called epinephrine, I probably will use those interchangeably, so it really doesn't matter, adrenaline, epinephrine. That is what, what's responsible for getting us moving. It's also responsible for our sense of fear and paralysis in fear. So if people are feeling that they're not motivated or as motivated as they would like to be, there's a key step that people need to take, which is to start focusing on the craving aspect and dopamine. Because if you can make enough dopamine, you can motivate, you can actually crave moving through challenge. So we can talk about how to do that. But just to underscore how powerful this relationship is between motivation and dopamine, there was an experiment that was done. It was been done in rats, but it's also essentially been done in humans through naturally occurring things where basically if you put a rat next to a lever with some juice or or even with um you know something really really good that a rat likes they will press that lever for that delicious tasting thing and they get pleasure from it if but if you take a rat and you deplete it of dopamine and you move that lever one rat length away it won't even move one length of its own body, right? A few inches to hit that lever. And people are the same way. You can still experience pleasure without dopamine, but you won't get up off your couch. You won't challenge yourself to go talk to somebody you want to talk to. You won't apply for a job. You won't pursue the new, uh, you know, fitness uh, protocol, etc. So dopamine is about craving of pleasure. It's not pleasure itself. And fear comes from this pathway, right? This pathway of dopamine into epinephrine. And the way to think about fear is it's just one other dimension of motivation. And we can talk more about that. But 
If people are living in fear, it is absolutely essential to understand that developing some sense of craving, even if it feels scary, you know, wanting something but being afraid to pursue it, that's the, the trigger for these molecules to start being released and to move towards it. But we've all sort of um, been told or conditioned that if we feel fearful, that that's a sign that we should back away or stand still. And biologically, that's just not true. I wake up in the morning and I want to reach for my phone. But I know that even if I were to crank up the brightness on that phone screen, it's not bright enough to trigger that cortisol spike and for me to be at my most alert and focused throughout the day and to optimize my sleep at night. So what I do is I get out of bed and I go outside. And if it's a bright, clear day and the sun is low in the sky or the sun is you know starting to get overhead, what we call low solar angle, then I know I'm getting outside at the right time. If there's cloud cover and I can't see the sun, I also know I'm doing a good thing because it turns out, especially on cloudy days, you want to get outside and get as much light energy or photons in your eyes. But let's say it's a very clear day and I can see where the sun is. I do not need to stare directly into the sun. If it's very low in the sky, I might do that because it's not going to be very painful to my eyes. However, if the sun is a little bit brighter and a little bit higher in the sky, sometimes it can be painful to look at. So the way to get this sunlight viewing early in the day is to look toward the sun. If it's too bright to look at directly, well, then don't do that. You just look toward it, but not directly at it. It's absolutely fine to blink. In fact, I encourage you to blink whenever you feel the impulse to blink. Never look at any light, sunlight or otherwise, that's so bright that it's painful to look at because you can damage your eyes. But for this morning sunlight viewing, it's best to not wear sunglasses. That's right, to not wear sunglasses, at least for this morning sunlight viewing. It is absolutely fine to wear eyeglasses or contact lenses, so-called corrective lenses. In fact, those will serve you well in this practice or this tool because they will focus the light onto your neural retina and onto those melanopsin intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells. That's keeping you stuck. Like it's easy to say, like, just move. You got to take the action. Sure. But a lot of people still, despite understanding that, intellectualizing that, are unable to, you know, basically act as if. Yeah, I think we're dealing with two general categories of people who have problems with motivation and focus. And I think we've failed to decide, um, excuse me, I think we've failed to describe the fact that there are two groups and not one. We think, well, I need to calm myself enough to move forward. I think, and then other people say, well, no, you need to kind of ramp yourself up to move forward. Here's what, the way I conceptualize it based on the data that I'm aware of. Some people are just hypo aroused. They're just not motivated enough. And those people would benefit greatly from cultivating practices like super oxygenated breathing. Mm -hmm. So this is something along the lines of like tumo type breathing. So rapid, and we look at this in the lab, we're actually running a human study on this now. So 25 or 30 deep breaths through the nose and out through the mouth, then exhaling the breath and holding, learning to how to self-generate adrenaline. That's what you're doing yeah, when you're doing some that. Some version of the Wim Hof yeah, technique. Or that's what, what that is. Brian McKenzie talks about. Right. A, a, an ice bath is doing the exact same thing. Stimulating adrenaline response. It, it actually improves the immune system. There's a mm -hmm. published paper on this. Releases adrenaline, which buffers the immune system against infection. But getting good at taking yourself from low, low energy to higher energy. And then learning how to compress your focus. And I'll talk about the focus thing in a minute. Some people are so agitated, the monkey mind, they got too many things going on and they're thinking, okay, they're trying to sit down and write. I suffer from this. And I'm feeling like, wait, I've also got this person I need to connect with. And I'm kind of dro being drawn off course by not being able to put the blinders on. For people that have that issue, I think learning how to calm the nervous system is very powerful. And the best way that I know how to do that is based on two studies, one published in Nature, one published in Cell Reports recently, showing that physiological size, there's actually a thing in the literature called physiological size, are one of the fastest ways to bring our overall levels of autonomic arousal down. And a physiological sigh is a two inhales followed by an extended exhale. So it's like, it's not just a deep breath, it's two inhales, followed by an exhale, mm. okay? And what that, what that does, and this has been shown several times now in humans, 
and other species as well is it dilates the, the little sacs of the lungs and that second inhale dilates them a little bit more and it pulls a little bit of carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream so that when we exhale, we offload the maximum amount of carbon dioxide and it perfectly adjusts the ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the bloodstream and lungs. And sometimes it only takes one of these double inhale exhales. Sometimes somebody needs to do two or three, but that's the fastest way to bring the autonomic nervous system down. A lot of people need such a tool because I think we talk a lot about meditation and tools for calm and you know I can go to Esalen for a weekend and get a massage, I'm gonna feel very good, but then when I'm thrown back in real life, I need something that's gonna work in real time, what I call a real time tool. And most people don't know how to control their autonomic nervous system because it's complicated. I can't control my liver function. I can eat, that will calm me, but that has complicated you know issues with it too if I'm just eating to calm yeah. myself. So. The diaphragm is the one skeletal muscle organ that was internally, right? We've got obviously skeletal muscles designed to move things. It's a skeletal muscle organ, unlike the spleen, the liver, the heart, et cetera. It was designed to be moved vol voluntarily. And these physiological sighs are actually occurring fairly regularly during sleep to adjust our levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And there's a recent study showing that in claustrophobia, this is the breathing pattern that people default to, mm. to try and offload wow. that carbon dioxide. So what happens during a meditation practice at the neural level? In order to answer that question, we are going to be scientists. That means you and I are going to be scientists now. We are going to break down a practice into its different component parts and address what we know for sure about the brain activation states that occur with those different component parts. In order to do that, let's use a somewhat generic form of meditation, but it's generic and pretty far reaching because I would say that for most people, about 75%, let's say, a meditation practice is going to involve stopping, meaning getting out of motion, sitting or lying down, and in most cases, closing one's eyes, although it is absolutely not required to close one's eyes during meditation. There are many forms of meditation that are done eyes open. But for most people, it's going to involve stopping our movement, that is not ambulating, not walking or running, so seated or lying down with eyes closed. When we do that, meaning when we sit or lie down and close our eyes, as trivial as that shift might sound to you, it actually is a profound shift in the way that your brain and other neural circuits in your body function for the following reason. When we close our eyes, we shut down a major avenue of what's called exteroception. What do I mean by exteroception? Well, very briefly, we are sensing things on our body and in our body all the time. We are also sensing things from outside of us all the time. So these could be sights or sounds, touch on our body, sensations with inside our body, etc. Now sensation is distinct from what we call perception. The sensations that we happen to be paying attention to. So at any given moment, you are sensing many, many things. There are sound waves hitting your ears. There are pressure receptors on the bottoms of your feet, sensing your shoes or your sandals or the floor, etc but you're not perceiving them until you place your attention on them. Now, the way perception works is that you have so-called spotlights of attention. You can't perceive everything all at once. Every sound, every sight, every touch, that would be overwhelming. In fact, that would be terrible. Rather, you have spotlights of perception that can either be very narrow. So for instance, you could focus all of your perception right now on your big toe of your right foot and really pour all of your awareness, your attention into what you're perceiving there, what it feels like, if there's tingling or pressure, heat or cold, etc. Or you can broaden that spotlight to include both feet or all your toes on both feet and then your legs and your whole body or the entire room. 